Well, to have your say is return to Haiti, more than three and a half years after that devastating earthquake, to find out how the country's doing. More than 200,000 people were killed in that January 2010 quake. A million and a half people lost their homes and were forced to live in tents. We've come back to find out what's happened to those people. Are they still living in tents? How much progress is the country making? We're going to talk to Haiti's Prime Minister, Laurent Lamont, about his plans to create jobs and also his idea to promote Haiti as a tourist destination. But most of all, we've come here to hear from Haiti's people, to understand from them what they feel about the direction their country's going in. Hello and welcome to World Have Your Say. Today, the program is coming to you from Port-au-Prince in Haiti. In fact, it's coming to you from a place called Jalousie. This is a we started in Jalousie, where the houses have been painted in pastels, a project to beautify the area. Yet memories of the horrific earthquake are still vivid. I mean, it was, it was actually well, hell on earth. We heard the noise then, we thought it was coming from the sky. But then we, 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 we felt our feet moving, like, you know, in, in, in opposite directions. And it was crazy. I looked to my right, to my left. I'm, I'm watching buildings going down, dust. It was terrible. People crying, calling out to Jesus, people calling God. Me personally, I was asking God to forgive me for my sins because I'm thinking the earth was going to split wide open and I was going to fall straight through. I'm like, <laughs> God, if I'm about to die, I want to ask you please to forgive me. As Haiti rebuilds after that earthquake, People here don't want to be defined by what happened. The painting project is supposed to raise spirits. Critics say it's painting over the poverty. But how about those who live here? Here in Jealousy, there's been this project to beautify the houses, painting them in these stunning primary colours. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's beautiful. The project is great because it, it, it created a lot of jobs for a lot of people that was here that wasn't doing nothing. And it was just sitting, praying that God will drop something for them because poverty is one is one of is one of the big issues here in Jalousy. Even though you see people looking happy, you see happy faces, but in the inside it's really sad to say that um, there's a lot of people here that's living in poverty and that's hungry. The houses are beautiful but Yeah, but the people that live in the house are living not living a healthy life. Bon, difficile. Life here is difficult, this woman told me. We don't have employment. We sit here under the sun and buy things on credit. But we don't have jobs. Sylvester Telfour, who worked on the mural, which now lines the walls of Jalousy, says it's brought real benefits. The most important part for us is that it created employment. Because when you give one person employment, you give their family employment. When you give 15 people employment, you give 15 families employment. Relaxing in Place Boyer. This was a sea of tents immediately after the earthquake of 2010, as those who lost their homes moved here. Now the squalid camp has gone, and this is a public space once more. Since I was last here, the transformation is remarkable. A symbol of the earthquake's devastation has become a source of pride. As the choir practices, the women employed to keep Place Boyer pristine reflect on their lot. The common complaint is that life has become so much more expensive since the earthquake. Life's hard. Everything is hard, she tells me. Food's expensive and I can't pay for my children to do their exams at school. After the earthquake, there were 1.5 million people living in tents. The conditions in which a cholera epidemic, widely believed to have been introduced by UN peacekeepers from Nepal, flourished. 
This is Champ de Mar today, once a notorious camp in the city centre. Now the government's moved everyone out, giving rent subsidies to encourage people to leave. Hello, how are you? Nice to meet you, Laura Trevelyan. Thank you. you so much for doing this. Haiti's Pleasure. Prime Minister, Laura Lamont, tells me progress is being made. When we took over, we had over 1.5 million people living under the tents in very difficult conditions, living on public spaces and um, having very little hope that tomorrow would be, uh, would be better. There are 320,000 people still living in the earthquake survivor camps. Are they going to be there forever? No, we, we, I mean, we plan to relocate everybody by the end of President Martelly's term. That's the objective that we set forth, and that's what we plan. And as we speak, people are being removed um, from under the tents. But on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince is what aid agencies fear could be a slum in the making. This is Canaan, but it's hardly the Bible's promised land. Makeshift homes stretch as far as the eye can see. The government says 300,000 people could live here. That's only an estimate, and more people are arriving every single day. This started out as a camp for survivors of Haiti's earthquake. Three and a half years later, it's become a gigantic, sprawling shantytown. People who live here fear they're in danger of being forgotten altogether. Rosamond has been here since the earthquake damaged her home, and she's never left. We don't have water. We don't have electricity. We don't have anything, she tells me. Despite that, Canaan has become a magnet for the poor. The government claimed this land for victims of the earthquake, so people feel they can't be evicted. Inside a makeshift school, Venice leads the class in song. It only costs a few dollars a month to send children here, but without jobs, many parents struggle to make ends meet. Venice feels Canaan is out of sight and out of mind. We're like people that have been abandoned, says Venice. All of our problems are our own. Haiti's government is now going to provide running water and electricity to Canaan. But aid agencies worry that people here are vulnerable to mudslides. The hills have hardly any trees because people cut them down to use as charcoal. So what happens when the tropical rains come? We're cutting between 30 to 40 million trees per year. So, so we have a 98.5% deforestation rate in the country right now. This is, you know, when you inherit a situation like this, you know, it's a very difficult situation. So we're focusing on discouraging the people from using the charcoal, especially in the, on the commercial side, you know, through campaigns, community campaigns, and, and parallel to that, working to plant back um, and, and in, in, in Port-au-Prince, for example, uh, we, are, so we started a massive uh, reforestation campaign. But of course, it's going to take years and education and sensibilization for people to really, and, and give people alternatives in order for, for the tree planting campaign to, you know, to, to be successful. As we've traveled across Haiti, people have told us that what they want more than anything else is a job. So how does Haiti's government create jobs? Well, just look at the beach behind me and the beautiful sea. Many other islands in the Caribbean have thriving tourism industries, including Haiti's neighbor, the Dominican Republic, that shares this island with the country. The problem for Haiti's government, as it tries to encourage and develop tourism, is how to overcome the image that many potential tourists have of Haiti as an unstable country. So we've come here to Jack Mel on the southern coast to find out how people here think tourism should be promoted. Blue skies, palm trees, and the inviting Caribbean Sea. All that's missing are the tourists. Welcome to hidden Haiti. Minister, why should people come here to Haiti? It doesn't seem like an obvious tourist destination. You have to understand that Haiti in the latest 70s, beginning of 80s, was a big tourism destination for the jet set. We used to have a lot of cruise ship. Uh, the cruise ship industry was uh, very important for us back then. And we used to receive a lot of, not only excursionists, but 
regular international tourists. Um, let's not talk why they're not here anymore and why we, um, Haiti, uh, begin to have the image that it has today. But what we can say is that since two years with this new administration, we decided to put Haiti on the top of our five pillars, economic pillars. We are in the, in the heart of the Caribbean. The Caribbean today receives more than 43 million, 40, 40 million tourists per year, so which is a, 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 a quite big amount of, of tourists coming to the Caribbean. And, and Haiti, of course, having all these natural sites as the other countries, the nice beaches, the waterfalls, but we have what we call the added value. And our added value is our culture, it's our people, it's, it's the food, it's, it's the art. So all these combined with the natural sites puts together a different product that we're, we're launching in the Caribbean. On the beach in Jack Mel, we meet Nico Audon. This Haitian who emigrated to Canada has returned to enjoy the surf. I hope to see this country get back on its feet. Because when I was a kid, Haiti used to be the most beautiful country in the whole Caribbean. Things deteriorate, deteriorated just too bad. But Haiti would be the perfect place now for the tourist people to invest and come back and get that nation, get back to its feet. To encourage visitors, the tourism ministry is building new earthquake-proof facilities at Jack Mel's beaches. At one of the few hotels here, the staff wait for the tourists to come. The owner is hoping the push to promote tourism brings in more guests. Who's your target tourist? Middle age, a bit better educated people probably, because it needs a, a certain level of education to understand what, what is going on as well. And, uh, you know, an openness of, of, of mind to, to you know, just, not just lay on the beach and expect you know, for everything to go right, because changes are, you know, some things will still go wrong here. <laughs> uh, but it, they will go wrong with a smile and, um, and really, you know, I've, I never have people who leave here at the end of the trip and, and, say, and say that it was a nightmare or something, something like that. They go and they say, you know, we will be back uh, or we, they've never seen anything like, like this. The people, the food, the, you know, the beaches, the, the nature and, you know, the whole population is, is waiting for, for people to come and, and to, to share what they have. You know, we don't have much, but we want to share it. Tourists who are worried that Haiti is a country plagued by natural disasters, by political violence in the past, what would you say to those tourists? We have a slogan now that it says Haiti experience it, but um, when we translate it in Creole, it's Haiti, you have to be there. C'est la poula. Of course, just telling them that Haiti is not only poverty, um, Haiti is not only disaster, Haiti it's, it's much more. So it's, it's the other coin, of, it's, it's the other face of the coin. Tourism would bring much needed jobs and money to this nation. So the hard work is underway to change perceptions of Haiti in the hope of a better future. Haiti's government must also deal with the country's reputation for being one of the most corrupt in the world. If businesses are going to invest here and create jobs and tourism is going to grow, corruption has to be tackled. An interesting topic which has come up a bit uh, is the question of corruption, something that Haitian governments have suffered from down the ages. What's your government doing to combat corruption? We have a zero tolerance in corruption in this government. We've reinforced the anti-corruption uh, budget by 40%. We have hired over 100 agents, anti-corruption agents, going from the border agents to, to field operators, to going to, uh, you know, to investigators. And we manage already over 60 arrests for corruption related in the past six months. So this was unprecedented before 
uh, in this country. Because the perception is that Haiti is 165th out of 174 countries when it comes to the perception of how corrupt it they are. And, and that, even that was an improvement because we, were, we, we, were, we, we ranked last in the corruption and we're working every day to move, to move it, to, to gain into that particular ranking that's, that's made by Transparency International. And we're also working with them in order to improve, um, to improve that score. But, you know, we don't, we're not, um, we cannot say that w corruption is going to disappear from one day to the other. What we can say is that we're taking significant steps to discourage corrupt, corruption and uh, corruption-related practices in the public administration. Haiti has endured so much. Earthquakes, natural disasters, and a cholera epidemic. As we traveled the country, we found a desire for change. It feels as though life is returning to normal after the earthquake. The emergency phase has passed, but the persistent poverty which blights so many lives remains. Let me say something.